Welcome to ANN In Depth. This thought provoking podcast provides valuable insights from credible scholars and leaders within the Adventist community to help you understand the Seventh day Adventist Church, its structure, practices, and beliefs. Whether you are a lifelong Adventist or a curious listener, stick around. I'm your host, Alyssa Truman, and this is ANN In Depth. Anthony, I am so thrilled that you are here with us today. You serve in the Ministerial Association here at the General Conference headquarters, and you are the editor, would it be the editor of Elders Digest. So what I'm most excited about is today, we're really going to delve into the roles of the local church leaders. So we're going to focus primarily on elders, but also kind of navigate... um, Deacons, deaconesses, because they kind of fall under your portfolio as well. So I became a elder this year. You were, I believe, at my um, ordination um, um, service. And I'm going to be honest, it's it's a new, a new role for me. I've served pretty much every other function in the church at some time. But the role of an elder is a very, um, I believe it's a very humbling. It's one that should be taken with a lot of thought and prayer. To me, I see it as the pastoral call for the lay member. So what qualifications do we look for in a local elder? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. And secondly, I think elders, deacons, deaconesses are so significant. Um, you know, that what they do is just extraordinary. You, you asked about the specific roles of elders, what what we're looking for in elders. Well, first of all, they need to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Somebody who loves, adores, and and is following Jesus. Um, there's there's a level of commitment there. Do, do, do you know which? It's it's a demanding role, and so. The commitment needs to be commensurate with that. We're also looking for for people who can lead and and make an impact in the local church that are respected by the local church because an elder to function, they need to be elected by the local church and ordained. It's two important criteria. And so by being elected, it's an indicator of the respect and regard and the recognition of the qualifications of that individual. And certain people will bring certain strengths to the role, mm-hmm. depending on the, the spiritual giftedness of each individual elder. So what do you see as the, well, actually, I'm going to back up before I get to that question. So we're elected by a, the church nominating committee or whomever, um, who generally we hope prayerfully are considering these qualifications. Of course, and then the whole church as a body votes on the nominating committee report. So when an elder is elected, it's with the support of the whole body of that congregation. So now elders have a have a service though where there's an actual ordination service why do we do that service what what is the differentiation we don't do this with our sabbath school teacher what what is why do we see the role of an elder in a different light well looking through the the whole biblical text from genesis to revelation elders are very significant they in ancient israel the elders they they had a huge uh, pull on the people, you know. They they led the people. They influenced the people, and it's it's the same today. In the New Testament, when when Paul and Barnabas, when they were on their missionary journeys, they weren't just about baptizing and leading people to Jesus. They left those people in the care of elders, which is really crucial. They, the elder's role, as it was back in those days, it still is today, to spiritually care for and nurture people, to lead them closer to Jesus, 
to lead them in their understanding of the word, their understanding and experience of Jesus Christ. So discipleship. Elders are called to disciple. Um, and you cannot disciple if you do not understand and have it be a part of your own lived experience. If I don't have a relationship with Christ, I can't disciple others into having a relationship with Christ. So when you're ordained as an elder, you're like always an elder, correct? I mean, it doesn't mean you're always serving in the function, but that's a one-time ordination. It is. Um, and provided you, you don't lapse in your journey with Jesus, it it remains with you. However, for each term, an elder needs to be elected. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's not a, a lifetime election. Um, and you need those two vital things to be elected for, for the term that you're serving as an elder and to be ordained. It's, it's like two, it's been described as two legs to walk on. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the reason why the, the election is so important each year is that, that the time might come when the church might think, hey, we, we need a little variation. We may need a change. This person could be working their daylights out, you know, yeah. in a sense, because typically an elder, they're bivocational in a sense that they're, they're working, usually full time, and carrying the responsibilities of an elder. They're not small responsibilities. And it really is demanding in many ways, physically, financially, other ways. And the church, for the benefit of the individual and for the benefit of the, of the body, might say, thanks, but let's just pause this and we'll come back to it in the next term. And depending on the church, it might be a one-year term or a two-year term. So let's talk about what these demanding responsibilities are on an elder, um, because it is very different than, you know, a lot of different positions that we hold in churches. What are some of the responsibilities? Let's kind of take them one at a time and how we see them manifest. And we're also a global church. So how does this change with where we live? That's a great question. Thank you. You know, you're right. It, it varies considerably around the world church. But on any given Sabbath, 80% of our congregations are led by a local church elder. And so wait, I, I'm going to interrupt you because I want to make sure I reinforce this. 80% of our church congregations on yes. a given Sabbath are led by, our, by their local elder. Yes. Now, are you talking about like preaching or they happen to be there? Like They're there you... and they're preaching. There, there is no pastor. And when I say pastor, I'm talking about interns, licensed ministers, or ordained pastor. There is no pastor in that congregation that day. In some parts of the world, there could be multiple pastors in one church because it's a large congregation. But I know situations where one pastor has more than 80 congregations. Eight zero. Eight zero, 80. In many parts of the world, it's typical for a pastor to have two, three, four. In other regions, it's typical to have six congregations. And 20 to 30 is really quite common as well. So in a way, an elder is a local lay pastor. I mean, I know that's another term used for something else, but really they serve in the function of a pastor when he's not there. The majority of our churches, that's a fitting description. So my brother-in-law had a four church district in Texas and- He's the pastor? He was the pastor. He's now right. moved on to another church district where he has an associate. So he went from a four church district to a church with an associate. But um, there is a huge dif distinction between those because you're right. You know, they had elders who preached at all of them. Um, I remember when I was growing up, my dad was the head elder in our church. My mom was the head deaconess. And we would sometimes go eight, 
nine months without a pastor, like when you're in between. And so my dad would have to make sure that there was an elder that was speaking. And so this is a very common thing you're saying around most of the world. It's the elders are really these nurturers for their congregations. Mm -hmm. And as well as that, they're normally doing biblical instruction with a Sabbath school class, um, as well as the preaching. Um, the church board can be, often be their responsibility in that situation, not just to attend, but to lead. Um, and then there's the, the actual pastoral care. Um, a lot of that falls on the, the elders, the deacons, and the deaconesses. And, you know, you, you, you think, I, I don't know of a, a category of people, if I could use that word, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that donate as much time, energy, and finance as our elders, deacons, and deaconesses. It's extraordinary what they give to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You know, this is, it's very, it, it's an intriguing thing. I've seen this because that's how my parents' life, <laughs> I remember very fondly actually looking back. My parents gave, we were always the first ones to church. We were the last ones to leave because my parents were holding, they were carrying out the roles that they had been elected to, to hold. And it actually gave me this beautiful picture of church um, leadership and like a, how you fit into the church structure. For us, it, the pastor never was this like end all be all. It was always this local congregation. So as I'm hearing this, so I, I see a challenge immediately. My first one is um, I'm in communication. Okay. I'm a communicator. Um, my husband is a graphic designer. We both serve as elders. But now I'm being asked to preach. I'm being asked to give Bible studies. I'm being asked to do pastoral care. I've not been trained in any of these. Now, I mean, and, I actually am going to school for the ministry, so it's a little bit different. But most people, because you're talking about bivocational, you know, you might have a chef, you might have a what. It doesn't matter what role. All of a sudden, we're asking them to do stuff that pastors go to school to learn. And there's another essential element that we haven't even touched yet, and that is leading the church in outreach, oh. reaching the community, <laughs> and leading people to Jesus. And it's, it's important that they lead the youth, praying for the youth and attendees of the church. But beyond the attendance of that congregation, to be reaching the community as well. That's another vital part. Okay, so let's Don't actually... Don't sigh. This I is know. an exciting <laughs> thing. All of a sudden, I'm feeling even more the weight of what I was called to. I... I'm excited though, but let's actually break these down one at a time. How are we helping equip our elders? Let me tell you to, about to be to <laughs> preach. Let's take them one at a time. How are we equipping our elders to be better preachers? Because a lot of people are like, ah, I don't really enjoy going to my church because you know we have the elder preaching. He's no good. Well, that's a bit harsh. I, I, I'm, yeah. But I'm saying I've heard it. I'm probably guessing you have heard it. It, it doesn't mean that it's accurate. How I would say, I've them? got to interrupt you now. Go ahead, interrupt. <laughs> I've got to say that's really inaccurate. Some of our best preachers are not ordained Seventh-day Adventist pastors. Some of our best preachers are local church elders. The most memorable sermons I've heard often come from local church elders. The ones that I remember from my boyhood years and that's a long time ago now, they're etched in my memory. It can't be memory. that long ago. It would surprise <laughs> you. So you, you asked, how do we train them? At the conference, there's a position, the Ministerial Association Secretary. Their role is, along with the pastor of the church or the churches, is to offer training, coaching, and development of elders, deacons, and deaconesses for their responsibility. So they will often conduct training seminars, um, workshops to build and grow the elders, as well as the deacons and the deaconesses. 
The church also produces resources, and this is where Elders okay, you Digest, can plug. You yeah. can put your plug for Elders Digest in here. <laughs> yeah, and we, you know, it's a, a quarterly journal that looks at the whole reason it exists is to grow and resource elders, deacons, and deaconesses. In each issue, we provide four sermon manuscripts, and I've got to say, I haven't written any of those. They're good. And if an elder uses one of those as the foundation for a sermon, the, the people will receive an excellent sermon. And so, can I, I've, I've got to finish this. Okay. One of the best preachers that's ever been in the Seventh Day Adventist Church was a person who never received any formal theological education or training. Ellen White, an outstanding sought after speaker. And people just didn't come just to out of curiosity. Thousands of people came to hear her because her content was so good. She was an outstanding speaker. And formal theological education, yeah, I believe in it. You, you know, I've received plenty. I don't want to brag or skite, but, you know, if you look at my CV, you, you'll see it. it. It's features there. It's there and it's important. But God does amazing things when, when he calls a local church elder to minister. And we can never discount that. So I want to be fair. I said something that was kind of provocative. I understand that. Well, you lit Someone me like, up. <laughs> I know. It was great. I loved it. Be because it is important. I have heard that. But you're right. Some of the most influential people I've ever heard speak were actually not the local pastors. As and good as they are. They are. They are yeah. great. And we're not discounting our pastors. Yeah. But sometimes almost the genuine, um, like the, the lack of, of having been trained and feeling like you have to do everything very, you know, precise and like this is the proper order of a structure. They often just like talk about Christ and how they see him and it becomes a much more relatable kind of a sermon because they preach how they would want to hear. And so I think that, you know, it some again, some of the most memorable sermons I have actually heard have been from lay elders. And and they have a, a real advantage in that they've often been in that congregation, not just for a few years, but decades. Yeah. And and they know the people. They're there week after week, you know, year after year, unlocking the doors, turning the lights on. Filling the baptismal tanks. <laughs> yes. And then at the end of the day, emptying the water from the baptismal tank and turning the lights off and making sure that the, the church is safe and secure. They, they know, they often know better than the pastor, with all due respect to our pastors, and I'm one of those. They often know the situation of the local church members better. And so when they speak, it's not as though they're confronting with finger pointing, but, but they can nurture. So much so that I, I know people when they've died, They've left it in the will because there's over the, the journey of that person, there's been a, a long turnover, a long history of turnover of pastors. And yes, they've been close to those pastors, but they wanted this particular local church elder to officiate at their funeral. And it was a lovely funeral. You know, and I, I think, that's actually an interesting statement because pastors come and go. But you're right. Many elders, they've been around forever in those churches. They do know the congregation. They know the people. Um, you know, we, we attend a, a relatively large church, which means that we have a relatively large amount of elders. And there are people, though, that our pastors with a congregation of over a thousand are just going to have a struggle being able to connect with everybody. But there is a circle of people that I connect with. So this actually brings us on to one of the next things that we do is, is pastoral care. So elders visits. I, I call it pastoral care because that's really what it is. Um, a pastor, it will be 
challenging for them to meet with every single member. I think we we ask too much of our pastors. Um, we expect them to be all things to all people while also preparing a brilliant sermon. And you know what I'm saying? Like they can't mm-hmm. do it all. Exactly. So one of the m- most important roles of an elder is actually to visit these church members and then bring back to the pastor if there are needs or whatever. It's to be that almost intermediary um, in leadership. What advice do you give to new elders who are embarking on pastoral care visits for the first time? Sorry for the pause, but that's that's a good question. And there's so much I want to say about visitation. And th- this could be like a whole nother episode, right? Uh, <laughs> more, more than that. First of all, prepare yourself for the blessing. Because when you visit, you will be more blessed than the people you actually visit. It's a, it's a, a wonderful experience to get to know people, to, to nurture, to hear their story, listen to their story. Listen to how Jesus came into their life. It's, it's a wonderful experience. You know, just, just a couple of weeks ago, we had the Lord's Supper at our church. And there was a, a person that was sick and unable to attend. And so I was asked to go and conduct the Lord's Supper with this person in their home. It was a lovely time. I can't begin to describe. Yeah, I had celebrated the Lord's Supper that morning, but in the afternoon, to celebrate it again and and to to see how this person treasured that, that that was exceptionally rewarding for me Mm. to to hear their story. It, It wasn't a long time, but I walked out of there on air. And I've got to say, I've, I've done a lot of pastoral visit, visitation in, in my ministry, both as a, as a pastor and as an elder. And it's always a blessing. It really is. So first of all, prepare yourself to be blessed. Pray about the visit before you, you go. And sort yourself out, you know, because this visit is not so much about you, it's about them. And so if there's, if there's stuff that you need to sort out, your own oxygen mask, if you know what mm-hmm. I mean, as they always say in the plane, you know, fit yours first before you fit somebody else's. But without being selfish, you know, make sure your issues are resolved with God so that you can give and that you can focus on the person. And it's nice to have an intentional plan when you visit. What, what, what are you going to talk about? What, because it needs to be more than just a social call. Because a social call can go on and, and achieve little. But to ask the right questions. I'm not talking about probing personal questions that, you know, are, are not appropriate. But I'm talking about, yeah, how did this person discover Jesus? How is Jesus important in their life? Uh, how is God blessing them at the moment? Have they found a gem in their personal devotional times recently? Um, ask them how they can be supported in prayer. Get to know their their circle of loved ones, friends, and pray for them by name, individually, and continue to pray well after the visit. It's always nice to to share a Bible verse or two. It doesn't need to be a long reading, but a a verse that's going to touch the person, and there's a lot of those, let's face it, and pray for the person during the visit. And It, it, that prayer, it would surprise you what a blessing that is. People love to be prayed for. That's Not true. so long ago, I visited a person who I'd, I've known for many, many years. 
but their experience with Jesus has gone cold and they've actually become an atheist. He and his wife. And I thought, I visited them, I wanted to see how they're doing, let them know we were still thinking of them. And I said to him, I said, can I pray for you? And he laughed at me and he said, what? You, you know I don't believe, what's this going to do? And I just said, humor me. It can't do any harm, can it? Well, if it makes you feel better, you can pray for us. And it wasn't a long manipulative prayer because those prayers can be prayed. But I prayed for him, his wife, his children by name, their health, the business that they're operating, their life, what they're going through. And that they would catch a fresh glimpse of Jesus. And at the end, both husband and wife are wiping their tears from their eyes and they're saying, thank you. It's been a long time since somebody did that for us. So these are some of the important elements that I would say are part of a, a, pastoral, uh, an, a pastoral visit that an elder, a deacon and a deaconess can, can do. And I would say, don't visit alone. You know, visit with your spouse, visit with another elder. Um, that's, that's important as well. And a visit with eternal benefits doesn't need to be an eternal visit. <laughs> you know, a, a lot can be achieved in 15 to 20 minutes. Like there, there are some times when you need to, to go through things and process things. But for a, 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 an elder, a deacon, a deaconess making a pastoral visit, 20 minutes is a good time. So what I'm I'm gathering because I I like to create like systems and structure in my mind. So when we come to visit, um, one we set up kind of guidelines that will only be here fifteen to twenty minutes. We let them know we're not we're not being here for an eternity. We care about eternity, but not <laughs> staying for eternity. That's right. Um, and then it's good to ask questions to get to know them, to know what challenges they may be going, to know who their family is have some sort of scripture that kind of ties, tries to tie in everything that we've said or is like a promise. And then we close with a, a meaningful prayer, not one where we are praying conviction into them, mm. although it could happen, but just a genuine care for them as individuals. Exactly. Um, and then we leave because mm -hmm. we don't stay for eternity. Um, I, I love that because I, I love kind of understanding like a structure, like, you know, obviously you can kind of deviate and, you know, have a little bit of whatever, but kind of knowing what I'm going in and like the things to do is really actually very helpful. Um, and can I also add, yeah. the, the question always comes up about food. And, and. I actually was thinking about food in my head. Okay. So to be fair, actually, I was pondering and I was like, yeah, we're good, we're good. We're good. But because you knew. <laughs> I've had the privilege of visiting and, yeah, instructing people on these visits in many different countries. And I've yet to go, to go to a place where people haven't said, you know, it's part of our culture to have food together with a visit. I've got to say this though, we have homes to eat in, to eat our own food. I wouldn't go to a place expecting to be fed. And secondly, when I make an appointment, I tell them, please, no food. And I can remember my wife, she was almost ready to put a sign around them my neck when I was in pastoral ministry in the local church, don't feed the pastor. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so because it, it can be a, a bit of a humbug if they see somebody coming from the church and they're thinking, I've got to entertain these people with hospitality and with food and drink. 
And it can be an inconvenience. It can be a financial issue. Mm -hmm. All sorts of things. Uh, even time to prepare. People don't have that luxury. So, yeah, I I would say, yeah, don't don't expect food, and tell people not to to provide it. It's 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 really not necessary. I like that, and and it also, I mean, sometimes you may not prefer what was made. I'm like, I don't like onions. So if someone makes something with onions, I would sit there and I would try to choke it down because I'm being polite. But it actually takes away allergies, any of those kind of issues nowadays. It just takes away all the stress from both sides of the situation. Yeah. Um, now, there can be other occasions where food is very appropriate. You, you know, like food at a church, I think is essential. You know, the, the, the kitchen in a church is as important as what we often refer to as the sanctuary because that's really the the lubricant of fellowship and it's it's nice to have that in, on occasions and it's important so i'm not discounting food but it's it's when it happens when it, and if you think about it the way you're setting this up we're talking about 15 to 20 minutes we're all good. We don't need to eat for 15 to 20 minutes. I could grab some food on my way or, you know, have whatever in the car, but we don't need to be. And if you stack a bunch of these visits in a row, nobody needs to be eating like four times in one hour just because yeah. we're going to different homes, for instance. Exactly. But now, there is a new challenge that I see with pastoral um, visits. And that is that nowadays, some members aren't actually local. So we are having online congregants. What what do we do to offer the same kind of pastoral visits, these pastoral care, to people who don't live locally anymore? Excellent question. Of course, technology is a real help here. Telephone calls, Zoom, Skype, all those types of things can facilitate that. Text messages. Um, I think social media goes some some way, but that's often impersonal. I think it's the personal contact. Um, in some situations, a personal phone call can be extremely valuable, um, but nothing replaces a personal face-to-face -face visit where you can see their eyes sparkle and you know it's that's that's a nice experience you're right um our church has a number of members who are distant from us and so actually it's one of the things i've wanted to tackle is being the one who the elder who offers pastoral care to them because mm -hmm. one i don't mind technology um which is a good thing since i work in communication <laughs> but um because they can't be neglected as well mm -hmm. and it's easy because they're kind of like out of sight out of mind and so it's it's important for us as we start seeing how the church adapts and shifts and how how does that change what elders do and what are we doing to proactively help bridge that gap with those who are far away with this local church environment? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a good question because people often do travel considerable dif distances. Often people will travel into a city to attend a church or into a town and they'll live remotely and it'll be a considerable journey. You know, biblically, there are so many examples. For example, in the book of Acts, Barnabas, he went and made a personal visit to Saul. You, you might remember the story. Saul, after his Damascus Road experience, had to leave Damascus. He ultimately came back to Jerusalem. The, the members didn't trust him there. Barnabas stood by him, supported him, helped him tell his story, and then Paul began to preach in the very places where he'd been persecuting Christians. And then that raised a commotion. He went down to Caesarea. And then the brethren said, 
look, it's better if you actually go home. And so they, they shipped him back to Tarsus, Saul of Tarsus. And then sometime later, Barnabas was asked to go to Antioch. And then Barnabas made a journey from Antioch, Pisidian Antioch, to Tarsus. It's 148 miles. Think wow. about that. You, you know, and it wasn't as though we set the cruise control and just got there in an, in an hour or two. The typical journey was 20 miles a day, 148 miles. You know, we're talking about eight days travel. There's a Sabbath in at least one Sabbath. He wouldn't have traveled on Sabbath to that extent. And so eight, nine, ten day journey. And then the text describes how he looked for him until he found him. And then he brought him back to Antioch. So it was a round trip of at least 300 miles. And you think of the days invested in this one individual. But think of the benefit of that. Hmm. Often going the journey makes a tremendous person, a tremendous impact in a person's life. And even Jesus himself. You think of the distance that he came to visit humanity. And then in Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter 19, Luke only records Jesus going to Jericho once, but he made a special house visit to a short guy that was hated by the community that had to go up in a tree, Zacchaeus. And I'm sure Zacchaeus never forgot that. And salvation for that child of Abraham came to that house because of that visit. So many times there's stuff that can't be achieved in the foyer of the church or from the pulpit, or dare I say it, in the coffee shop. It happens in people's homes. Hmm. There's there's a level of vulnerability that it that you're afforded in your own home mm. um, that is needed in order to be able to truly help people fall in love with Jesus. You have to be vulnerable to fall in love. Yeah, um, and that includes with G with Christ. Mm -hmm. And when we go and sit in a pew, and really for the most part. In most churches, you know, you do participate by maybe putting your offering in and, you know, standing up and kneeling and standing up and sitting and all that um, and singing. But for the most part, it's really just a you kind of are being talked to, which makes it very hard for that that intimacy, that vulnerability to happen. So these home visits are so vital because it's really, truly where we actually become a community, where we become a family. Um, you know, there's a phrase. Pastors, elders, deacons and deaconesses are often referred to as stewards of grace. Hmm. And to me, that is so significant. Whatever it takes so that a person may be able to receive and experience the grace of Jesus Yes, it can happen with preaching. It can happen standing outside the, the church, maybe in the car park or in the steps of the church. It, it can happen anywhere. Let's face it. We, we talked about Saul going to Damascus to butcher Christians and the experience that he had there where he, he discovered the grace of God. It can happen anywhere. But when we're stewards of grace, we look for it every and any opportunity to do that. And it may involve making that journey. So being the stewards of grace to be able to share this message, one of the other things that you mentioned that elders do is we, we're also supposed to be trying to go out and reach the community. So how do you, what is our role in evangelism? Excellent. Um, it's a big role. It, it involves personal evangelism, role modeling Christianity. But it kind of scares me. We, we make a, a big emphasis, and rightly so, on the importance of our actions. But we have a mouth as well. 
we need to speak. And we need to speak personally to people and also publicly. So what do, you mean by action? what do you mean by actions? Because you see, we speak a lot about our actions. So what kind yeah. of actions are we talking about? Oh, how we live our life. Okay. Yeah. Now, Daniel was renowned for praying three times a day. You know, it was, it was his life. There, there are some people that are, are more comfortable being out there in the community doing that than other people. Other people prefer the, the quieter time. But I've got to say this. People have got to know that we are followers of Jesus Christ and that we believe and trust his word and that it matters to us. And I don't think I could do it without speaking. It's actions as well as speaking. Jesus didn't just come and live a righteous life. He also spoke. And those words are magnificent. Amen. You know, I remember when I was young, I loved this saying. Um, uh, it was by, I think it was like, like a saint or something. But it was preach the gospel to all the world and use words if necessary, which sounds really great. It sounds really great because it really does talk about us, us living a, a Christ-centered life. But you cannot fully preach the gospel just by living a great life. You exactly. have to use words. And, and when you think those, those words, those teachings of Jesus are so liberating. And imagine going through life and being unfamiliar, ignorant of what Jesus said. Yeah. Now, how we do that, how we present it, there's a skill in that. Like we, we don't want to force it on people. But, wow, you, you can coax a conversation. You, you know, I know that when I smell food, I get hungry. Did you know? And in the same way, if, if we give people the, the, the scent of the beauty of Jesus, because there is a, a perfume to Jesus which is just wonderful. If they smell that, they're going to want to know and hear more. And we, I, I said we've got one mouth, but we've got two ears. We need to be finely attuned to, to their interests, to their needs, what appeals to them. We need to be prayerfully intelligent how we approach these conversations. But I'll guarantee this. If you pray for that opportunity, that prayer will always be answered. You know, my husband, um, he works from home, so he he gets the privilege of walking around our neighborhood multiple times a day. So he walks in the morning, he walks in the afternoon. And so he started being able to, he knows all of these people in our neighborhood on a first name basis. He knows the names of their dogs. And they start talking about, oh, you know, Blue's owner, such and such. I'm like, no, I have no idea who you're talking about. But, you know, um, he was talking about the fact that he prays, like, Lord, help me to be able to pray with my neighbors. Help me to be able to share God's love to my neighbors. And, you know, he'll be walking. And he was recently walking by someone. They were kind of telling them something. And he felt impressed he should pay, pray for them. And then it just kind of didn't flow right you know what i'm saying so he kind of dismissed it and as he continued praying somehow they ended up walking past each other again so he stopped and they talked a lot and he's like you know i felt really impressed to pray with you and, and so he's praying with all of these neighbors but he's doing it in a way that's non-intrusive it he asks genuine questions it's kind of like these pastoral care visits he's doing them while he's walking around a neighborhood mm -hmm. asking what's going on in her life genuinely caring about them and then inviting them to, to be prayed for. And what you're saying is absolutely accurate. Some of them will have tears in their eyes because people, people, not just our members, but people just want to know they're loved and that someone genuinely cares. And I think that's the power of prayer. There's something about prayer because it's awkward. It's kind of awkward, you know, for, for many people. 
And having someone say, I'm willing to go through the awkward to, to open up our hearts to the spirit together. Like it's saying, I, I'm willing to ask what could seem like an awkward question to you and then to pray to somebody who's not necessarily here because I love you so much that I can't imagine doing anything different. Mm. That that just warms my heart. Like when someone asks me to pray with me, I don't get it a lot. It's very rare actually that someone says, can I pray with you? And it's always intriguing to me, like how it just shifts my whole heart, how it shifts how I view that person, how it connects me closer to Christ. Mm. Something that you don't naturally just get in a conversation that just comes with the power of prayer. You know, you're right about the awkwardness. There can be an element of that. But there's, to me, there's another element too, and that's the fear of rejection. Hmm. And get over it. <laughs> Seriously. Um, it's not such a big deal. It really isn't. We, we, we need to have enough confidence that the, the God of the universe, Jesus, wow, if, if we want to talk about rejection, hmm. and, and I haven't shed any blood for being rejected. This guy was crucified, literally. You, you know, what, what he endured in terms of rejection Wow, we should be rejoicing that we're sharing in some way. Now, to balance that, I'm not saying that we should share it in an obnoxious way, trying to look for rejection, not by any stretch of the imagination. We should make this as, as palatable and as acceptable and as welcoming as possible. But we need to give people the opportunity to know and experience Jesus, eternal life. And we're, we're scared how we'll feel for maybe the next few moments. And, you know, I think it's actually easy, not easy, but it's easier for people to accept it. It's more palatable when they feel like you genuinely care. If I, if I have taken the time to, to talk to you and, and, it, and I'm listening to you, I'm not rushing to come up with the next response or looking at my watch or checking my phone while you're talking to me. When I feel like I'm the only person, it's I'm it's gonna be a whole lot more palatable for me to have that to say yes to that offer. Yeah. So one, I also think it's about showing that genuine love of Christ and that listening and and just truly being present in that moment. That also takes that away. But you're right, fear. The mm -hmm. fear of rejection is it. I am someone who has struggled with fear of rejection. Like, it, you don't, it, my daughters have a saying I love. It's, it's only awkward if you make it awkward. And it's actually a brilliant saying. It's only awkward if you make it awkward. It's not awkward to ask. It's even if you get rejected, what, just as you said, get over it. Mm -hmm. it. It becomes this thing like, oh no if we decide to make it that way. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, they said no, and you just yep. move on with your life. Exactly. You know, we, we talked before about the importance of visiting in homes. The mirror to that is how important it is for people to come to our homes. Hmm. To, to show them love, appreciation, and acceptance. That's, that's really important because we shouldn't be waiting for people to show that they accept us, we should be accepting them. them well before that, inviting them to our homes. Bring the food out. <laughs> Here's the contradiction. <laughs> this is where we get the food, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but this is more like the kitchen area. This is where we're coming to fellowship rather than for yeah. a pastoral visit. There's a, a little bit of a distance. But it can quickly merge. into Yes. Yeah, don't, don't worry about that. And I think back to... Our pastoral experience in Australia, my wife and I, we, we had a wonderful time in ministry. And I can't think of anyone that we baptized 
that didn't come to our home or at least eat some of Deborah's cooking. You, you I know? keep hearing about Deborah's cooking because you know I've also done an episode for my other podcast, a and Profiles. So I, I'm waiting for my visit now. Okay. okay? okay. Um, so the last area I kind of want to talk about, because you mentioned youth. So there's a lot of churches that are multi-generational. This means that we have multiple generations that are in the same church. But realistically, the new word, I guess, is intergenerational. We're, actually, these generations are worshiping together. It's more of a collaborative community rather than just the fact that we happen to have lots of generations in our church. So there's a lot of talk about our young people leaving the church. What do you think the role elders can play in creating a more intergenerational feel into our churches that may help answer the crisis of our young people leaving? Mm. Know those kids. Know their names. Be an active part in their lives. Whether it's with pathfinders or other activities. But get to know them. Know what they're going through. Know, know what they're encountering. Pray for them. Pray for them by name. Parents need help. Hmm. Mothers, fathers. And particularly those in single parent homes. Now the church needs youth are vulnerable and that the church needs to have good systems in place so that the youth are protected because tragically there can be cases of predatory behavior even among the best credentialed in a church. So a local church needs to have good processes in place so that the youth, all people, including the elders, deacons, deaconesses, and the pastor, are protected from what may eventuate. But, but in an appropriate way, be in those kids' lives. If the, if the elder isn't praying for them, who is? You, you know, pray for them, know them, do, do stuff with them. Um, and not just the, the Sabbath school teachers. We're talking exactly. about every member in the church needs yeah. to yeah. have these relationships. Yeah. And and youth, they've got so much energy. You know, what what can the church do for them on, on a Saturday night after Sabbath? What what is the church providing for them at that time so that there's there's options for them in their community? What's happening for them Friday night? Oftentimes Friday night. It's, it's we, even harder. Yeah, we collapse into Sabbath exhausted. But the kids are just winding up. It's the start of well, the weekend. Well, they don't know what to do because yeah. all of a sudden they're limited. They can't go out and do this. They can't do that. It's like all these can'ts in their mind. Mm -hmm. What are we saying you can do to? Exactly. And, you know, get the kids together. Have fellowship. Give them spiritual options on on that Friday night and the Sabbath afternoon. Because if we don't find options for them, there's another power of evil that will. And I'm not saying it needs to be entertainment, but I think it needs to be focused and invested time in them. And I, I can remember when I was a kid, the, the elders, how they invested in Friday night, Sabbath afternoon, not Sabbath morning, it's Saturday night. I used to look back on them and I thought, I look back on them now and I think they must have been just exhausted <laughs> with what they were going through. Did you know, like some of these, you know, volunteers in the church, they had employment that demanded them to get up at unearthly hours in the morning. And they'd work hard during the day. And then in the evening, they were investing in us as kids. Praise God for them. And I mean that genuinely and sincerely. You know, I um, when I was growing up, I think everyone in the church knew who I was. I mean, it, was, it wasn't a big church. So there was like 160 people, okay? But they would talk to me by name. They always seemed interested in my life when I had come back from academies, when I came back from college, when I got married. Like they 
they genuinely cared. And that always made me want to be that same kind of a person because I recognized how important it is. I mean, I've had young people buy me a Minecraft account just so I could come hang out with them in Minecraft. I'm like, I'm an adult, but they wanted me to be with them where they were. And I think that's something that we need to think about is that sometimes being with them, I mean, this wasn't on Sabbath, but you know what I'm saying? But mm. it, it's not always where we think that we want to be. And it doesn't mean do something that's wrong, but trying to figure out how to meet them where they are so that you can create these connections is really important. And, you know, I've, I've been in Sabbath school classes where people will, oh, we need to pray for our youth. We need to pray for our youth. Very, I, I do believe we need to pray for our youth. But I ask the same people, I'm like, well, how many young people do you know the names of? They don't know them. So I'm like, so you're just doing this general prayer for our young people, but you're not investing in them. And I think that there's this. There are many that do. No, uh, yes, I'm yeah, saying that there's, yeah. and I'm showing that there's this this difference. You know, I've I've seen these experiences where it it changed my life, mm. and then there's a lot of people who say it, and I think this is that difference between that intergenerational and that multi generational. It's it's that, and we we have to start understanding we are a family, mm. and we are a church family, and so we have to invest in our young people, invest in these relationships. Because there are a lot of young people who are sitting in our churches right now because their parents force them to come. They want, they want to believe there's a reason to be there. And the words that we speak might make the difference in them knowing that they matter. Mm. There are many young people whose parents have given up on bringing them to church. Mm -hmm. I was talking to some friends this week. They've, they've just given up. It's not worth the fight. If I Who's could... reaching out to them? Mm -hmm. And this is why these relationships matter mm -hmm. is because if you have somebody who you know is going to say something to you when you come to church, it makes a difference. To me, the most important thing is, is how we treat people, particularly the youth, because people remember how they're treated longer than they remember what they hear and see. How, how does the church treat me? How does it value me? Not that we're bribing kids to come, but we just treat them kindly, graciously with the love of Jesus. Amen. And I think we need to, I think there's been a lot of great challenges to me as a new elder, things I need to, keep in mind. And for those who are listening, who are serving in a role of an elder or a deacon or a deaconess. Just real quick. Okay. Some some resources for those particularly that, that would appreciate it. I mentioned Elders Digest, a great quarterly journal specifically for elders, deacons, deaconesses. We also have manuals. How, real for, quick, how do they get Elders Digest? Okay. You, you can get it hard copy. We have 100,000 English subscribers and it's translated into 13 other languages and there's another 100,000 people receiving it in those languages. So talk to your conference. It's, it's really inexpensive. If you take out a bulk subscription, it's $1.20 US a year for a subscription. That's 30 cents an issue. That's ridiculously cheap. And it's good quality. All right. So there's Elder's Digest. There's manual, uh, a manual, a handbook for elders and another handbook for deacons and deaconesses. And also online, there is Ministry in Motion. If you go to ministryinmotion.tv, there's over... 200 training programs on all manner of things that would be helpful to local congregational leaders, elders, deacons, deaconesses. There's a great amount of stuff. Now, for Elders Digest, once the hard copy's been out for a year, they're all put up online for free. So, and I think Elders Digest has been around for over at least 20 years. So there's 20 years of resources there. If you go to Elders Digest, the, the website, 
bang, it's all there waiting for you. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I know I'll go take a look at it myself as well. Um, before we go, I, I'm wondering if you could have a, a closing prayer for us um, and just pray for those who have listened, who, especially those who are serving in these roles, that that they will understand what the Spirit has called them to do mm-hmm. um, and that they will also do that which the Spirit has called. Sure. Let's pray then. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the ministry of Jesus, that he came, and loved, cared, lived the perfect life and died for each one of us. Father, thank you for the disciples that we have on this planet today that walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Pastors, elders, deacons, deaconesses, so many others. And Lord, I'd like to pray for those disciples now. Bless them, strengthen them, keep them close to you. But Lord, I'd like to particularly pray for our elders, deacons and deaconesses that give so much, that surrender so much. Lord, uphold them. Bless the congregations where they serve. And Father, bless their families and bless the the pressures that are upon them. Help them to be able to manage. Guide them, Lord. And Father, our single prayer is, is that Jesus will return soon. And when he does, we pray, Lord, that each of these people that we've prayed for, with all of their families and their loved ones, will be gathered together that we can go home together, celebrating joyously, skipping and dancing, immersed in your grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for tuning into this episode of Amen In Depth with our guest, Anthony Kent. If you enjoyed what you heard and want to stay up to date on the latest episodes, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And don't forget to tune in next week for more engaging conversations that will challenge us to grow and learn together.